I recently described a man who microdosed mushrooms that he bought on the dark web. As I mentioned in the first line of the description of this video, this was two cases in one. The first case was an original patient who ingested cyanide-laced magic mushrooms that he bought off what appeared to be the dark web. The detail here is that you can't always pick out exactly what a patient was doing. Sometimes they'll tell you, and what they tell you is partially true, and it's not because they want to lie to you, but sometimes they just can't remember. And sometimes I'm saying that just to give them the benefit of the doubt. The second case was one that was published in literature and it made headlines in January of 2021. And that guy did think that he was microdosing mushrooms by injecting a boiled tea of those mushrooms. And this isn't new. People were documented to do that several decades ago. There's people who believe that they could crush up certain bugs and put them directly into their veins. It even happened in 2025. People sometimes get their own ideas. Sometimes those ideas aren't right, but people do get them. The report says that the man believed that he was microdosing by brewing it and injecting it. Whether or not this fits your definition of microdosing because you take it in capsules or whatever capacity actually doesn't really matter because by definition, he is in fact administering an amount much less than what would be considered the therapeutic dose. And this subtherapeutic amount is in fact a microdose. That's two words. I know what microdosing is, the one word version. And unfortunately, from the clinical, and if you want academic standpoint, the primary criticism of it is that these microdosers are believing in a placebo effect. My personal belief, I don't necessarily believe that that's entirely the case. That wasn't the point of the video. He did microdose in his own interpretation of whether he micro or macro dosed, he was gonna get sick regardless. But we'll talk more about that later. The actual point was cyanide in the mushrooms. He was a 24 year old man presenting to the emergency room with altered mental status, diaphoresis, tachycardia, hypotension, vomiting, dizziness, and crampy abdominal pain. He had had at least two seizures before presentation. His nail beds and lips were cyanosed. Skin was pale and cold to the touch, but body temperature was normal. His mother told admitting staff that he was an avid recreational substance user and had recently changed his sources from a local person to an anonymized online service and paid for with cryptocurrency. The patient was confused and anything he tried to say was incomprehensible. In this case, there was a recent local wave of cyanide poisoning, so it was suspected. Enough to give hydroxycobalamin, the antidote. At best, the five grams treats the cyanide poisoning. At worst, you gave him a form of vitamin B. And so cyanide poisoning in itself is kind of odd. It doesn't happen often here in the United States. And when it does happen, it's usually from fires, like burning houses and cars. The people caught up in the Los Angeles wildfires in early 2025 may have experienced it among with many other things, like lead in the air even. It blows away when the smoke clears. When building materials are burned, or some of the fabrics that you find on furnishings, these are cyanogens, so compounds that make cyanide gas. They also make carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide gas, and in the short term, this is what's meant by toxic gas poisoning. These are all toxins that can cause immediate harm. And of course, lesser known and understood is the longer course of harm that happens years later. We're finding more about that from 9-11 first responders and veterans who are exposed to burn pits. Cyanide explains everything in this patient. Seizures, unconscious, that's the altered mental status if you really wanna be specific about it. Blue lips and nails. Maybe, probably, he wasn't even having a magic mushroom trip, but that he was hallucinating because of hypoxia to the brain. What does cyanide do? Well, it's a mitochondrial toxin, so it alters cell metabolism. By saying mitochondria, we know that it's impacting ATP production. If you look in some physiology textbooks or online resources, you'll find often that it says that cyanide ion is what binds to the mitochondria. And this could be true, but looking at this chart, we know that the pH of blood is around 7.4, meaning that at and around physiologic pH, cyanide ion doesn't exist. It's hydrogen cyanide. Even in chemical industry for copper electroplating, metal cyanide needs to be kept at very high pH in order to prevent off-gassing because lower pHs will create hydrogen cyanide, which is a gas, and that's what's deadly. The United States used cyanide for capital punishment starting in 1924. It's technically legal in some states still, but it hasn't been used since 1999. 
In the first instance of use, the person receiving the capital punishment was placed in a room where potassium cyanide salt was mixed with sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid. It's diprotic. So for every one mole of sulfuric acid, you get two moles of hydrogen cyanide, which is the gas. And the report says within five seconds of hydrogen cyanide entering the chamber, the person fell unconscious, and 20 minutes later, they had to air it out. Okay. So hydrogen cyanide, not necessarily cyanide ion, is what's going into the mitochondria. But then what? Well, you'll see in those same textbooks that cyanide binds to ferric ion, that's iron plus three, in cytochrome oxidase A3. Remember, ferrous ion is iron two plus. What is cytochrome oxidase? Well, we know that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. That's the high school biology definition. What is a deeper description of it? Well, if you look at where ATP production happens, specifically where the TCA cycle occurs, you get a better idea of how it is the powerhouse of the cell. On complex one, NADH unloads electrons while pumping in protons, while the succinate from TCA cycle unloads electrons to complex two. Complex one and two put electrons on ubiquinone, Q, which transfer those electrons to complex three. Complex three moves electrons to cytochrome C while pumping protons into the intermembrane space. Complex four pulls electrons from cytochrome C and then uses those electrons to reduce oxygen to water while pumping in two protons. Because complex four pulls electrons from cytochrome C, we can say that cytochrome C is oxidized. And so complex four is also called cytochrome oxidase, which is where cyanide binds. Inside cytochrome oxidase, metal ions are needed to shuffle those electrons to pump protons in. There's more than just iron present in this complex, there's also copper. And so we have experiments showing that while HCN does bind iron, it likely binds to copper as well inside the mitochondria. And what happens when the shuffle of electrons here is blocked? There's no more proton gradient that can be formed between this membrane space because the final step in the process is the production of ATP as protons flow out through the pore back into the matrix. And if ATP isn't produced anymore, then you have disruptions in cellular metabolism. Oxygen can't be used and you have local hypoxia and anoxia. It's not hypoxemia in this case because it's not a presence in blood. There's oxygen there, it just can't be used because hydrogen cyanide is blocking it. And so what do you do when you have this effective tissue hypoxia? Well, you get organ dysfunction. Parts of the liver start to die. The kidneys start to fail with rhabdomyolysis happening to the muscles worsening the kidney failure. That's if one is even able to observe this delayed effect. So did this patient have a trip because of the mushrooms or did he start having hallucinations due to the hypoxia from cyanide poisoning? Low oxygen going to the brain can cause an altered mental status to the point of being unconscious. And so luckily, the hydroxycobalamin was given in time to reverse the patient's cyanide toxicity. Knowing that hydrogen cyanide binds metal ions, the treatment involving B12 having a cobalt ion, which can bind to the hydrogen cyanide to reverse its bond with copper and iron in cytochrome oxidase is a relatively new advancement. It was approved for use in around 2005. Okay, so that's the patient who had cyanide-laced magic mushrooms. As far as we know, magic mushrooms don't have life-threatening toxicity when ingested Orally. Actually, I looked and I didn't find any recorded fatal cases of psilocybin overdose. And that's not to say that it doesn't happen, but given its mechanism of action, it gives some ideas as to why it's probably not fatal. So how about the patient who microdosed that mushroom tea? The thing with microdosing is that I'm not coming at it from a subculture level. I'm talking about it from a clinical, therapeutic, and efficacy standpoint. I think the word on the street is that microdosing for psychedelics is ballpark around one-tenth the dose that you would take for a regular trip. In our paradigm of how medicines work, microdosing is a bit of an enigma. The reason why we have dose-finding studies for every single medicine that's approved for use is that generally the medicine will bind to a target, and if and when a sufficient percentage of those targets are bound, you will achieve the desired effect. If an insufficient percentage of those targets are bound to the medicine, you don't have the desired effect. It's not binary in being an all or none effect, but in most cases outside of recreational use, if we were to say microdosing or giving one-tenth the regular dose, we would say that you're giving a sub-therapeutic dose. Depending on what medication class you're in, you definitely don't want that. Opioids for pain is one example. Antibiotics is another because that's an easy way of creating drug-resistant species. So I wanna take you to a kind of new age concept. This is something that has happened in our modern world. I think you've heard on the news that the water supply has detectable amounts of things like antidepressants and antibiotics. 
Should we or should we not be concerned about this? Well, if the test to detect it is actually sensitive enough to be accurate, let's just say a thousand times smaller than the therapeutic dose is present in the cup of water that you're gonna drink, well, there's an overwhelming force on that amount by your liver to break down those things that are coming from the water. You're drinking water, you're not injecting it into your veins, so it's gonna have to go through and pass through your GI tract. Let's just say that half that amount gets broken down on the first pass by the liver, so one two thousandth of the therapeutic dose. That alone might not even be enough to absorb into your body. And remember, the medicine has to distribute into tissue. If it's highly lipophilic, which most drugs that cross into the brain have to be, this means that one two thousandth of the dose will also distribute into fat tissue into the body. Then how much is actually getting into your brain? It's like one tenth of that. Now you have one twenty thousandth of a dose. There's no therapeutic value there and not even enough to cause an effect. The dose is so small that it's negligible and not even detectable by instrumentation because the overwhelming homeostatic mechanism of the body negates it. I mean, this is the cost of not living inside a sterile bubble, but it's how your body defends against it because humans have never lived in an environment shielded from the environment. Now, if your water looks muddy and it can be set on fire, then I can confidently say that you probably have more than trace contaminants in that water. Okay, so given all of this, is microdosing actually therapeutic? Because if we say that we're giving a sub-therapeutic dose to the degree of one order of magnitude, so let me repeat that, one-tenth the dose to cause an effect, is a microdoser actually experiencing a placebo effect? Well, we could go into the literature to see if anyone has answered that question, but you're not gonna find what you're looking for. If you look in the past, microdosing did in fact refer to small and sub-therapeutic doses of medicine, but the results of this are always going to be subjective. There's no definitive, quantifiable way to get an absolute answer for your particular situation. Things like creativity, social benefits, improved energy, they're not hard endpoints like overall survival, because that one is if you're alive or you're dead and how long it took you to get there, which is a hard quantifiable metric. The patient who injected mushrooms in an attempt to microdose them, he either read online or deduced himself that boiling them and injecting the result of that would be microdosing. And I'm just gonna put this out there, even before the pandemic, you had people who would make claims on things and back it up by saying that they did their own research. And the claims on these became super polarized and tribal to the point where people tied their identities to these claims and the conclusions, and then they create subcultures out of it. And to me, I don't care if you wanna do your own research, knock yourself out, read whatever you want, that's great. The thing is you have to know context. You have to know why the publication author is writing what they're writing, what question they're trying to answer, and why did they even come up with that question in the first place. Without that prior knowledge, you can come to conclusions, but missing a little detail here and there, or details, can become detrimental. Like not realizing that injecting boiled mushrooms wouldn't get you a regular trip that one would normally have. Context matters, and it can easily get lost. And so in this case, the 30-year-old man who injected mushrooms had a history of what appears to be bipolar, non-adherence with medicines for that bipolar and opioid dependence. He filtered the mushroom tea with a cotton swab, which for some reason causes something called cotton fever. Cotton fever had been described all the way back in the 70s when IV drug use was high, and users would quote unquote shoot the cottons in an effort to get as much yield as they could. But in doing so, it would cause a temporary intense fever, which is what this patient had before he came into the emergency room days later when he had already developed lethargy, jaundice, diarrhea, nausea, and hematemesis. This isn't the first time that someone has injected mushrooms. It's been described as far back as the 1970s. And I would guess that the idea of microdosing isn't new either. It just happens to be in the common consciousness at this moment. Although I have noticed since 2021, it's dropped off a little bit and it's focused on microdosing something else. At examination, this patient was unconscious, jaundiced, cyanosis of the lips and the nail beds, and he had hypotension. Basic metabolic panel finds electrolyte abnormalities followed by thrombocytopenia, kidney and liver failure that were determined to be acute. And the resulting clinical course is the classic septic shock into acute respiratory distress syndrome into disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. When I described DIC in the Chubby Emu video, that is, he was bleeding out of his nose, his eyes, and anywhere else where blood could flow out, it was oozing out. I think that detail was glossed over by me. 
In this case, I would say it's not poor management of the patient, but rather the medical team, I can almost confidently say, was not expecting that Psilocybe cubensis would show up in the blood culture, that the magic mushrooms that he was injecting were growing in his blood, along with bacteria normally found in his soil. Although it's maybe possible they just found some spores that was in his blood sample, and then they were able to grow that somehow. So the last thing that I wanna bring up is psilocybin. It's a prodrug, meaning that it has to be metabolized in order to be activated. So that's why you eat it. Anything that goes in the body by mouth will go through the liver as a first pass metabolism. Psilocybin becomes psilocin, which acts on serotonin receptor 5-HT2A. So that's a receptor subtype that coincidentally LSD binds to too. Psilocin is one hydroxy group away from dimethyltryptamine, DMT. Tryptamine is the backbone of serotonin coming from the amino acid tryptophan. These compounds are all related, like melatonin. That's probably why fatal overdoses are unlikely because these compounds don't cause autonomic effects like amphetamine or opioids. So what's the takeaway from this? It's don't inject mushrooms. Could psychedelics like psilocybin and others potentially treat things like depression given their mechanism of action? We're gonna need to see. But that's a little bit more in depth on the man who microdosed dark web bought mushrooms. It was actually a cyanide poisoning case that had a then pop culture hook and was actually two cases put together with one that was published in 2021. I actually wrote this video, this one, in 2021 and I'm recording it years later in 2025. Now the popular find is microdosing GLP-1 weight loss medicine, which was available back in 2021, by the way, years before it actually. Methods change, but principles always stay the same. Thanks so much for watching. Take care of yourself and be well.